Planes flying into food processing plants, explosions and fires at food processing plants, thousands of cattle suddenly dropping dead, and unprecedented droughts decimating food production. These are just a few of the insane events that have occurred over the last few months, and many are wondering whether all these events are coincidences or a part of some larger conspiracy. Today, I'm going to do a deep dive into some of the events that have been affecting food supplies around the world and see whether they're the result of accident, incompetence, or something more sinister. Before we talk about food, there's a disclaimer I must include. Nothing in the video is financial advice, though in this case, I don't know how that's something you'd conclude. In any case, you should know that entertainment and education are the only things you'll get from this dude. Please contact a financial advisor if your portfolio looks like poo, and talk to your friends and family if the contents of this video change your mood. Now, if this is your first time checking in, my name is Guy, and this channel typically talks about crypto things. Coins, tokens, news, reviews, you know, the sort of knowledge that will turn you into a crypto king. This time around, however, I want to talk about another topic to make you think. If that's something you can appreciate, subscribe to the channel and give that notification bell a ping. So, now that you know what I'm about to bring, let's look at all these food disruptions and see whether it's nothing or something. Unless you've been living under a rock or in your parents' basement, You've probably noticed that the cost of food has gone through the roof in almost every country around the world, and it's safe to say that the official inflation statistics don't capture just how much food costs have risen. This is almost entirely due to a combination of factors like inflation caused by central bank monetary policy, supply chain issues caused by pandemic lockdowns, and of course the ongoing war in Ukraine whose effects we covered in depth in another video. That is in the description. Anyways, another factor that is allegedly contributing to the rising costs of food is the abnormal disruptions to food processing facilities that we've seen over the last few months, namely in the United States, which is the country I'll be focusing on for the purposes of this video. Now, although there have been a handful of high-profile disruptions to food processing facilities over the last couple of years, these disruptions only became a hot topic at the end of April, when two separate planes crashed into two separate food processing facilities in the US just eight days apart. Naturally, news of these two incidents took the internet by storm and resulted in lots of speculation that these borderline biblical disruptions to food processing facilities were a part of a plan to further increase the cost of food in the United States by its enemies to create more social unrest within the country. Some went as far as to claim that these disruptions were being orchestrated by forces from within the United States that are aligned with international organizations like the World Economic Forum, which have been explicit in their desire to see meat consumption reduced around the world. If you Google the sentence food plant fires or any similar search string, you're likely to get a series of fact-check articles from the mainstream media debunking the idea that disruptions to food processing facilities are higher than usual in the United States, or that these disruptions are in any way intentional. Many of them also argue that there hasn't been an increase in disruptions. These incidents are just getting more media coverage because food-related topics get the clicks these days. The thing is that none of these articles reveal the frequency of disruptions to food processing facilities in previous years. Logically, comparing the frequency of disruptions in previous years to the current year would make it easier to assess whether this is a phenomenon worth investigating. The absence of these statistics from the mainstream media has consequently been interpreted as evidence that there is some grand conspiracy. Now, this begs two questions. Whether the frequency of disruptions to these facilities in the United States is in fact greater than in previous years, and if so, why? Now, I might be mistaken, but I think I might be one of the first to find answers to both of these questions. So, here's what I found. 
I'll start by saying that the fact that there is no data on disruptions to food processing facilities in the United States in previous years is not evidence of a conspiracy. This is simply because the National Fire Protection Association, or NFPA, doesn't collect data about fires at food processing facilities specifically. As you can see, the NFPA only collects data about fires at manufacturing and processing facilities more broadly, and between 2015 and 2019, there was an average of more than 5,300 fires at manufacturing and processing facilities every year. If you do the maths, this works out to a dozen fires a day on average. This is why some fact-check articles about fires at food processing facilities seem to imply that the 30 or so fires since the start of the year are nothing out of the ordinary, even though this number applies to all manufacturing and processing facilities more broadly. Not very honest journalism, if you ask me. Now, if the NFPA doesn't collect the data we need to assess whether there's something out of the ordinary with all these fires, then where can we find it? Well, one way would be to crunch the numbers manually, but given how much Google is burying related results, this would be very difficult to do. This is unless you focus on a specific niche in the food industry, which is exactly what I did, and to be honest, it happened by accident. During my research, I came across a news and analysis website for the poultry industry, which explained that there had been seven fires at poultry facilities between 2020 and 2021. This suggests that we should see an average of around three to four fires at poultry facilities in the United States this year. I wanted to see if I could find confirmation of this statistic, and funnily enough, it was confirmed by a comment in a fact check article about food processing plant fires by Reuters from May this year. In this article, Reuters asked a spokesperson from the National Chicken Council whether these disruptions were out of the ordinary. He said, quote, I can only speak for chicken, but like any manufacturing plant slash industry, there are generally a few fires that occur each year across the country. Assuming a few means three or four per year, then this is consistent with the statistic given in the news and analysis website for the poultry industry. The only thing left is to check how many fires at poultry facilities there have been so far this year, and it looks like there have been at least three, based on a list created in June. Given that we're only halfway through the year and have already hit the yearly average, this suggests that 2022 could see as much as double the number of fires at poultry facilities. If we assume a similar trend for other types of food processing facilities, then it's clear that something's not quite right. I'll caution that there are a few assumptions involved in this conclusion, and it's quite possible that more data will come to light about the food crisis in the coming months that changes it. It's also important to note that there are more than 2 million farms and 35,000 food processing facilities in the United States. As such, even if all my assumptions are correct and we are seeing significantly more disruptions at food processing facilities, they are unlikely to have a meaningful impact on the food supply of the United States, as they make up such a small percentage of the total pie. The bird flu going around is clearly a much bigger threat as it's resulting in the killings of millions of chickens in the United States and elsewhere. Now, you can learn more about the factors actually contributing to the upcoming food crisis using the link in the description. Anywho, even though all these disruptions at food processing facilities are unlikely to have a meaningful impact on the food supply in the United States, it still begs that second question, and that's why there seems to be a significant increase in disruptions at these facilities. One possible answer is the pandemic. Some people retired during the pandemic, other people switched jobs, and a few of them stayed unemployed until their savings, stimmy checks, and or side hustles were no longer providing sufficient sustenance. The end result is a workforce that is not nearly as productive as before because workplaces are being restructured and new employees are being trained. That is a recipe for disaster when you're talking about industries, such as agriculture, with higher risks of workplace accidents. Oddly enough, I wasn't able to find any statistics on workplace accidents or injuries for 2021, probably because they've yet to be published by the Bureau of Labor Statistics. For anyone wondering, there was a sharp decline in injuries and accidents in 2020, which isn't surprising given that everyone was locked down. 
This ties into the second possibility, and that's that rising costs are causing food producers to cut corners to save on said costs. Safety tends to be the first corner to be cut, and with the food crisis the rest of the world is facing, many food producers are also probably working overtime. Lots of potential accidents, therefore, waiting to happen. There's even some speculation that some food producers are intentionally sabotaging their own operations to get massive amounts of insurance money. Food insurance fraud is apparently on the rise here in the UK, though I couldn't find any similar headline statistics for the United States. Now, this relates to the third possibility, and that's that these food processing facilities are being disrupted on purpose by some third party, be it foreign or domestic. Not surprisingly, the fact checkers insist that this is false, and there are, of course, no statistics about arson in the context of food processing facilities. This means the only option is to do a similar analysis to the one we did earlier, but in this case, a few additional assumptions are required, so the answer will be more speculative. The first assumption relates to motive. Why would someone, specifically a third party, want to set fire to a food processing facility? You'd think the obvious answer is because they want to disrupt the food supply, but recall that these disruptions are unlikely to affect the food supply of the United States at all. I'd like to think that this is something our theoretical arsonist would be aware of, but maybe they're just crazy or, you know, stupid. This arguably leaves just one alternative motive, and that's plain old ideology. There are some groups of people who are vehemently against fossil fuels, factory farming, and even just the consumption of meat. Among these groups are activists who have been known to sabotage and vandalize relevant facilities. Now, I'm by no means an expert on this kind of activism, but in my personal experience, many of these folks tend to be radical environmentalists. It seems my personal experience is relatively universal, as many have speculated that these food plant fires are being caused by said radical environmentalists. As you might have guessed, the fact-checkers have again insisted that this is false without providing any data, and if you Google any related terms, you won't get any meaningful results. That is, unless you consider the related headlines to be relevant, and this is where the second assumption comes in. Some of you might remember that there was a wave of wildfires across the western United States in 2020 and 2021. This isn't necessarily anything new, as wildfires are quite normal in that region. But what was new was a change in the causes of these wildfires, and that change was an increase in arson. If you Google wildfires arson, you will of course be greeted with a bunch of articles fact-checking the idea that the cause of wildfires in the United States is due to anything other than climate change. What's different with this search string, however, is that all the headlines about arson arrests related to wildfires. One of these headlines comes from the New York Times, which talks about a former professor who was arrested for allegedly setting multiple wildfires in California. Clearly, this isn't someone who's crazy, but then again, I guess it depends on your definition of crazy. Now, in this article, the author cites a significant statistic from California's fire agency. Quote, The number of arson arrests jumped last year with 120 arrests reported by CAL FIRE in 2020 compared with 70 in 2019. In other words, a nearly 2x increase in arsons, likely caused by folks like that professor. This coincides with the 2x increase in disruptions to food processing plants we're expected to see this year. And if you want more evidence of an uptick in arson related to activism, look no further than the hundreds of gigabytes of law enforcement data that were leaked by hacker group Anonymous in 2020. As reported by The Guardian, quote, documents from the Blue Leaks trove of leaked law enforcement records reveal that the same claimed association between left-wing activists and coordinated arson attacks has been asserted relentlessly in a stream of intelligence reports. How's that for a fact check? Anywho, it's important to reiterate that this analysis assumes that poultry facilities are representative of all food processing facilities, that these disruptions are being caused by third parties, that these third parties are ideologically driven, and that an uptick in arson attacks by ideologues elsewhere is evidence. Even if all these assumptions are correct, it still doesn't explain another unprecedented factor that's actually affecting food production, 
And that's all the extreme weather events occurring around the world that are reportedly causing thousands of farm animals to die and crop yields to fall. The most relevant example here comes again from the United States, specifically Kansas, Nebraska, and Iowa, where tens of thousands of cows reportedly dropped dead due to, quote, extreme heat and humidity last month. As with the news of the two planes crashing into food processing facilities, the news of thousands of cows suddenly dropping dead took the internet by storm and led to lots of speculation that this was all somehow connected to the disruptions at food processing facilities in the months prior. This is because the weather in both Kansas and Nebraska was well within normal levels compared with previous years. Many farmers confirmed that these cow deaths were not normal, but then again, it's Twitter, so you don't really know if these folks are farmers or not. Regardless, the fact-checkers charged in to dismiss the idea that these deaths were caused by anything other than extreme heat resulting from climate change, and once again failed to provide any statistics to put the mass casualties of these cows into context. Unfortunately, I couldn't find any such statistics because, well, Google. So let's take these speculators at their word, assume that these cow deaths are uncanny, and jump straight to the question of who did it, why they did it, and how they did it, because this is the most entertaining course of action. As with the disruptions at food processing facilities, it seems that the farmers have some motive to kill off their livestock. That's because the US Department of Agriculture has a livestock indemnity program, which gives up to 75% of the market value of any livestock that dies due to weather or animal attacks. If you hadn't noticed, the cost of livestock has gone up quite a bit, which could make killing off some cattle a counterintuitively lucrative enterprise. The problem with this theory is that farmers would probably make even more money from actually using the livestock to create dairy and meat products. Another problem is that if you look at the footage of the cow carcasses, it looks like they all literally drop dead on the spot. I suppose it's possible that poison could have been used, but I suspect it would take a lot of poison to kill that many cows, enough to raise red flags at most suppliers, I reckon. Clearly, I've been watching too many crime shows. There's also the fact that most farmers probably aren't the sort of people who would murder their livestock just for the money. Sure, those cows would have been slaughtered eventually, but as part of the process of food production. Now, given these facts, it's pretty clear that this cow catastrophe was in fact caused by the weather, which was again apparently within the annual norm, which admittedly doesn't make much sense. Some would say that leaves one last possibility that borders on conspiracy, and that's weather manipulation. Believe it or not, but this is where most of the speculation ends. Now, humans have been trying to manipulate the weather for thousands of years through all manner of rituals, dances, songs, and sacrifices. Obviously, none of these methods worked, but hey, A for effort, as my teachers used to say. Jokes aside, the first successful weather modification experiment is believed to have taken place in California in 1905, when a chap named Charles Hatfield received $1,000 from the city of Los Angeles for successfully making it rain during a drought, though this story is disputed. What is not disputed, however, is the creation of cloud seeding, which was pioneered by another American chap named Vincent Schaefer in 1946. Cloud seeding was subsequently used by the US military during the Vietnam War to strengthen storms as part of a secret project called Operation Popeye. Back then, the mainstream media was a lot more inquisitive, and it didn't take them very long to publish the details of Operation Popeye in a New York Times article in 1972. Two days after the article was published, Operation Popeye was shut down, and the US military claimed that the project had failed. Just a few years later, however, the United States, Soviet Union, and others signed the Environmental Modification Convention, which prohibited the use of weather modification for military purposes. This effectively confirmed that Operation Popeye and other such operations had, in fact, been successful. Case in point, in the 1980s, the Soviet Union used cloud seeding after the Chernobyl nuclear plant meltdown to ensure that radioactive rain fell on Belarus instead of Moscow. Yikes. Today, weather modification is surprisingly commonplace, with over 50 countries having weather modification programs, according to the World Meteorological Organization. 
The most famous of these programs comes from China, which has used weather modification for all sorts of fun stuff, notably making sure there was no rain during the opening ceremony of the Olympic Games in 2008. And that's really just the tip of the iceberg. In 2009, the Chinese government orchestrated an early snowfall for Beijing. In 2019, Chinese officials reported that they had successfully reduced hail in one region of the country by 70%. And in 2020, China said it would be doubling down on its weather modification aspirations, seeking total control of the clouds by 2035. Another country that's been using weather modification regularly is the United Arab Emirates, which frequently creates artificial clouds and rain to fight against extreme heat waves in Dubai. And yes, this is all legit. Fact check me, you'll see what I'm saying is correct. There'll be some links in the description too. Now, given that China, Russia, and the UAE have this extremely powerful technology at their fingertips and have been explicit in their intentions to increase this power, one can only wonder just how powerful and prevalent the weather modification programs of Western countries are, especially the US of A. Am I saying that weather modification is being used to disrupt the food supply? I can't say because I don't know. What I do know is that weather modification is somehow not a part of the food crisis conversation, nor a part of the climate change conversation. I reckon it's about time that it was. I mean, it's not like governments would manufacture a food crisis to roll out digital ID systems for food rations. That would be truly crazy. Say, did I mention it's already been done in Iran? And did you know that a digital ID system is required for the successful rollout of central bank digital currencies? No, it's probably nothing. More about that in the description. And that's all for today's video about the unprecedented events taking place at food processing facilities. If you have any comments, questions or concerns, drop them down below because I would love to know. If you enjoyed the video, smash that like button and don't forget to subscribe to the channel and ping that notification bell before you go. While you wait for the next one to hit the tube, here's what you should do. Check out Coin Bureau Clips for more content from me and tune in to the Coin Bureau podcast for deep dives into different cryptocurrencies. You can also follow me on Twitter, TikTok, and Instagram for hot takes and dank memes, and join my Telegram channel for all the daily crypto updates you need. If you're wondering what cryptos I hold as part of my portfolio, subscribe to my weekly newsletter to see how my allocations ebb and flow. And if you happen to be a true crypto lover, head on over to the Coin Bureau merch store and get yourself something that's suitable for summer. Now, you can find your way to all these resources and more using the links down below. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you in the next video. This is Guy bidding you goodbye.